everyone, it's your girl Jen, and today we are doing a book update. It's been officially a year since my last book update, and so I thought I would fill you guys in on my favorite books of 2019. I was doing some reflection uh, a couple weeks ago, and I actually numbered out all the books that I read last year, and it was 42. For me, that is a staggering number. Like, I have never ever read this many books in my lifetime. But anywho, today we're gonna be whittling it down to the top 10, so let's get started. So my first book is Essentialism by Greg McCowan. I picked this book up because I have always been the type to feel like overwhelmed and burnt out and spread thin. And I think it's because I've had this mentality of just like, power through it, grit your teeth, and suck it up. And I thought that that was the way I can just get everything done. But it's not a very sustainable mentality. Like there are some things you just gotta say no to. I had a problem just really prioritizing what was important and what was essential in my life. And I feel like this book really gave me the right tools and the strategies to kind of float up what is the most priority and finish those top things. I've learned that sometimes doing the most isn't the greatest thing. And it's important to spend your time on the right activities and the right people so you feel more fulfilled. Like being busy all the time doesn't mean that you're being productive. So if you are the type of person that kinda just wants to Marie Kondo their mind or just learn how to use their time more efficiently, I would highly recommend this book. In 2019, Brene Brown became one of my most favorite inspirational people. If you have not seen her TED talk on vulnerability, I highly recommend you go check it out. But I read Daring Greatly, which is just like a deep dive of the vulnerability movement and how you can live more wholeheartedly. It had a huge impact on my self-esteem and the way I connect with people. And I especially love the bit about empathy. So she describes empathy as connecting with the emotion that someone is experiencing, not the event or the circumstance. A lot of the times when someone is opening up to us or sharing an experience that they've had, like I think a common misconception is like, oh, I can't be empathetic to that because that has never happened to me. For example, let's say your friend's like, oh my God, like I went to work today and I shat my pants. Like maybe you have not shat your pants at work However, I'm pretty sure we've all felt the emotion of shame and embarrassment, and that emotion is what we need to connect with. This book gave me a glimpse on how I can live more unapologetically and just live more freely, and it's definitely a book that I want to reread because it's something that I want to keep fresh on my mind constantly. So my next book is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and I know this book came out a long time ago. Like, I actually first read it when I was 18. It completely blew my mind. Uh, but it's been like over 10 years and I was like, you know what? It's time to read it again. Let's see. I read it and it blew my mind again. And so now it's on my list. So this book is about outliers and outliers are like the most successful, the most intelligent, most athletic, just like the best of the best in the world. And that's why they're like the outliers. And a lot of the self-made outliers, we look at them and we're like, damn, you did the damn thing. And yes, that is a huge factor. They did put in so many hours. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell says that you need to put in roughly 10,000 hours to master a craft. And that is a lot of hours, a lot of time. Like I can't even compute how many like years 10,000 hours is, but it's like a f ton. But regardless, we look at these people like uh, the Beatles or Bill Gates and we're like, wow, however, Malcolm Gladwell starts digging a little bit deeper and he, he starts to point out patterns and circumstances that have happened to have them like elevated up to that level. So he defines an outlier as those who have been given opportunities and who have had the strength and presence of mind to seize them. So obviously putting in the 10,000 hours is a big one, but there are other things to consider. Like when you were born, how long you've had a head start on starting something, like what your parents have, your ethnicity. There's a string of fortunate incidents and circumstances that have happened that have attributed to their success. So he uses Bill Gates as an example. You know, he's wildly rich, wildly successful, incredibly smart. However, there are some things to consider. So Bill Gates was born at a time where computers were just starting to like get big. They were pretty rare and very expensive. Like a computer was the size of a room and his parents just happened to have a computer in their house. So Bill Gates started to like tinker around with it, like learn how to code slowly. 
And then when he turned 13, his parents funded a computer club. So he had like unlimited access to these computers with all his like computer friends and they just coded. And Bill Gates just got consumed into coding and learning and he started to put in his 10,000 hours a lot earlier than everybody else. So by the time the computer started booming, he already had this like incredible knowledge about this subject that a lot of people didn't have access to. Like if his parents didn't have the money to give him like one of the first computers, he probably wouldn't be Bill Gates. And having a head start is a huge thing to consider in every type of craft. Like if you look at all the early tech tycoons, they're all like born at like the same year. Like Bill Joy, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. There's absolutely a pattern here. And this book just does like an in-depth review and analysis on that and I found it fascinating. Speaking of technology, we're gonna move on to our next book, which is called Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology by Adam Alter. I feel like so many of us are addicted to our screens. Like you are watching this on your phone or your laptop or your TV or wherever, like we are glued. And I have an alarming statistic. In 2008, adults spent an average of 18 minutes on their phones a day. In 2015, adults spent two hours and 48 minutes per day. I do not know what the updated statistics is for the year 2020, but I'm sure it has skyrocketed. I feel like some people might see it as like a fault in themselves, being like, oh my gosh, like I can't get off my phone. I have no willpower, I am weak. But the people behind this technology, it's their job to make it addicting as f And this book just gave me clear examples and just peeled my eyes back on like what is happening behind the people that are making this technology. So in 2010, Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, had a talk about the iPad. And it was just like this really long talk convincing everybody why they needed an iPad. And then later on in 2010, a New York Times article came out and Steve Jobs said that he doesn't let his children use the iPad. I just found it interesting that the very thing that he was convincing everyone needs to use is something that he doesn't even let his children use. A lot of the people producing these tech products avoid the very thing that they're selling. And it's because they know that shit's addicting. And he also explains like these boundaries we can create in the technology space. So I found it very interesting. So my next book is called Sapiens. It is actually the only book, like the real tangible book I have because I read the rest on Kindle or I listen to it on Audible. But I actually got this book at an airport and it was truly the best decision I've made. This is one very thorough book about the history of human existence. It's like if all your history and your like anthropology classes like had a baby, it would be this book. I absolutely love just her clear descriptions and also her commentary. And it just really like reminded me of all the things that I forgot in all those classes that I learned. I mean, it's been a very long time since I've been in school. So if I don't like have a refresher, I will not remember it. It was just really nice to be reinformed about the history and the existence of Homo sapiens. And it was, it's very impressive to see how we as a collective unit were able to just completely dominate the planet. Like we have been killing it for a very long time like literally and figuratively. Uh, we are the only species that know how to work as a unit with tools and to be able to like expand. And it, it explains why in such a short period of time, we have been able to just like bulldoze and create all these like, like agricultural revolution and then industrial revolution. Like we've been like freaking on it. And this book just highlights all of that. It's uh, very alarming to see how rapidly this has all been going. We have the capacity to like completely destroy the planet. Um, however, we have the capacity to completely save the planet. It's kind of like the Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. I have hope for us. So now we're gonna move on to some fiction. I have to talk about The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. This book was so good, I read it twice. I literally finished it and I was like, I'm gonna hit it again. I was like trying to like chase the, the high from reading it the first time. And honestly, the second time was really good because I got to like catch some things that I didn't notice in the first run. It's about Evelyn Hugo, who is an icon, like the Hollywood icon of the 1950s all the way to the 1980s. And with just wild fame comes some scandals along the way. So she's had seven husbands and she's been very like tight lipped with it her entire life. but. Like the book starts when like she's 
pretty much like 70 and like she's old. And so now she's like ready to talk about it and she does not hold back. The tea is hot. It's got everything. It's actually a very progressive breed. There's like a lot of visibility from race, sexuality. And I think that's something really refreshing to see, especially in a mainstream book. I mean, maybe I've just been in the dark with like what kind of books to read, but I love this. If you guys have any recommendations that are similar to this book and have the vis visibility and representation, please let me know. Like Evelyn Hugo is unfortunately a fictional character, but she is like real in my heart. Like Evelyn Hugo is like a character inspired by Mar Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor. And like, if you've ever been like fascinated of like that whole old Hollywood uh, lifestyle and what it was like to be there, like read this book, you will be teleported in. So if you guys know me, y'all know that I love me a thriller. For my thriller recommendation, I have Final Girls by Riley Sager. This one is definitely a read to just like pack on uh, like a trip if you're on the plane and you just want time to fly by, definitely give this a read. It's about this girl named Quincy and uh, she, this is not a spoiler by the way, this like happens right from the jump, but Quincy is like the sole survivor of this mass murder. Like she was like at a cabin trip with her friends and then this killer came and like killed all her friends except for her. So she's like the lone survivor and that's why she's called like a final girl. And there's only like a few final girls in the world and, and they almost like kind of like talk to each other because like no one can really like fully, fully understand what it's like to be in that position. It's kind of like a reverse murder mystery. You're like, the, mur the killing already happened and now we're just trying to figure out who killed who. So now we're gonna finish things off with some memoirs. I wanna talk about Hunger by Roxane Gay. This is the book to read if you have ever struggled with body issues, body image, and even like self-doubt. This was one of the most honest and powerful memoirs I've read because it was so raw. And a lot of her, the themes about self-doubt, like I felt like she was boiling down the doubts that I have on in my head, but into text and like just eloquently written. So the author is someone in the category of super morbidly obese. But hunger really opened up my eyes to the hardships that they face from the stereotypes to the physical obstacles. It was just very enlightening. And just the part about the self-doubt, I just really, really connected with her on that level. Michelle Obama, she needs no introduction. When I think of her, she's like, the definition of poise and grace. And sometimes it's like easy to forget that she's just like, all of us, like she's just a human. And I feel like after reading this memoir, it just grounded her. And I just found it really inspiring to see her work for what she's earned. Like she's been through a lot. And I also found it very comforting to know that Michelle and I actually have some things in common. For example, we both find huge comfort in preparation and we both love low light dinners with our mans. So, um, Michelle and I are basically like the same person. So my last recommendation is called Dry by Augustine Burroughs. I have been reading a lot of books about sobriety and this was my favorite overview of what alcoholism is like. This memoir is a journal he kept while he was in rehab and while he was out. And so he really does a great job describing that like insatiable desire for alcohol. And so, and he like explains what rehab was like and how getting out of it was like, and then just seeing the world through just like this stripped raw vision of like how far you've gone down and then just dealing with that constant temptation of like having a drink and how prevalent it is in our lives. So that's his memoir in a nutshell, but I feel like this memoir like really stood out to me because of his writing style. Like he has got personality. He's got sass, he's got wit. And like, I just found myself like laughing through it. And I know it's like a sad topic, like addiction, but I was like laughing. But yeah, this book definitely gave me a better perspective of what alcoholism is and how to recover from it. All right guys, those are my 10 favorite book recommendations of 2019. I cannot wait to crack open some more books this year. My goal by the end of 2020 is to read 52 books. Let's slap on another 10. Let's see if I can do it. I would love, love, love to get your guys' book recommendations in the comments down below. I think from this video, you guys get like a good vibe of what I like. I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye! Mwah.